Hey there, thanks for joining us for season two of The Dominant Ones, where we explore mastery and the pursuit of excellence through being dominant. I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce our final guest this season, Marcus Limonis. Marcus's story is one of resilience and triumph, from a Lebanese orphanage to the heights of American business and success. Thank you for coming on the show with us. We really appreciate it. How did it start for you? How did you, how did you find your niche early on? You know, I really struggled um, as a child to find my role with other kids. I was always the awkward kid, the kid that uh, I was heavy, unathletic, um, socially awkward, uncomfortable in environments. I, I suffered a terrible eating disorder. I attempted suicide twice. Uh, I was molested by a family member and I don't tell people all those things to have them feel sorry for me, but I tell them those things so they understand why I make the decisions that I make. And what I learned early on was that business was like a, it was like a neutralizer for me. I wasn't athletic, but I was really good at math. I wasn't, you know, good at dancing, but I was really good at opening up a business at seven years old. And I think that for many people that struggle with awkwardness or being different, um, you have to find something that you can beat everybody else at. And Mm accept the fact that there are certain things that you're just not gonna be able to overcome. You can't run faster, you can't be better looking, you can't make yourself smarter, but you can out hustle people and outwork people. And I I do liken it to athletics, right? Um, You played with Spud Webb, right? Was not a big guy, but he out hustled and outworked people. And there are other people in life who have demonstrated the ability to outwork people and out hustle people, but you're always motivated from unfortunately, sometimes an angry place. And I don't like to talk about it a lot uh, as an adult because it's not good for people to hear it, but an angry place, I like to rephrase as a motivated place. People said I couldn't do certain things and I wasn't qualified for this. And I always was, left out of things. And I think when you get molested, you um, start to really develop tremendous insecurity about life. And when you attempt to take your life, it's because you feel like there's no hope. And uh, I never want my story to be a dark story. There's always, you know, sunshine at the end of the rainbow. But I also tell people that because a lot of people who struggle today to, to be dominant can find something inside of them that they are good at, whatever it is, and just be dominant in the things that you're comfortable with and the things that you can be good at. And don't try to be somebody you're not. Absolutely. You know, it, you know a lot of things that you just brought up um, in your past is similar to a lot of us, you know, speaking of myself, growing up in Baltimore, Maryland, and being the man in the house since I was 12 years old, and was able to leave home when I was 16. So I went through some of the lot of same trials and tribulations you went through, but, you know, I, I really, um, you know, I'm heartful about just some of the things you've been through, but, you know, it just makes you stronger as something that you believe in, you know, yeah. and it, it sets you off on a course that even you didn't know you could achieve. So um, I, I understand the places where you came from because I come from some of the similar places in life, but it just made me find my purpose like yourself just to help you find your purpose in life. You know what, Nick? I think the difference for me is, you know, when I look at women or I look at Black or Latinx folks, I never, ever, ever, ever try to draw a parallel between my BS story of, and my sob story. My mom used to call it my, my, my sob story because she didn't think it was a good excuse. I was still afforded an opportunity. I was still given a nice home. I was still given a good education. And I worry about, and part of what motivates me to do what I do today is that as, as, as tough as my story was for me, mm-hmm. there are people that had much tougher stories, much less opportunity, and they still have the same BS restrictions today. And I'm more fascinated by people who uh, aren't given the education or the opportunity or the loans or the or the job because of their gender or because of their skin color. And that's part of really what's motivated me and why I do what I do Mm -hmm. is to try to kick down the door. My mom was a six foot two, 280 pound woman. 
And the reason I tell you that story is because she used to be able to tell me I could kick any door down that I want to, but there's other people that cannot. And your job in life when you grow up, I don't care what happens, is you're going to not kick doors down for people that can't kick them down themselves. Because what you're going to find is that if you kick that door down for them that may have been locked because people are prejudiced or because people are sexist or because people are racist, when you kick that door open, you're going to be surprised. Those are the people that are going to carry you through life because they know what it means to survive and thrive. You don't know. You're just a punk ass kid who maybe, yeah, okay, you tried to kill yourself. Okay, yeah, your family molested you. Great. That's not like being from the inner city with no money, not knowing where you get your food from, or not knowing how to educate yourself, or being told no all the time, or getting rejected all the time. It's a very different thing. And it took me a long time to really understand um, that difference, really a long mm-hmm. time. It's interesting. You're talking about um, the people who you kick the door down for if I understand you correctly, are the people that you can then sort of ride with or the people you know will have your back. You can, um, and I'm wondering how, so in the field you're in and the, ty- and the types of businesses that you've created and, and built, there needs to be a certain ruthlessness. There needs to be, you're in competition. And I know it from the individual point of view because I am my own business as an actor. I, I'm selling yeah. myself and I'm in competition with other people. But some of the people I am simultaneously closest with are some of the other actors I see in the audition room for my role all the time. They're the only other people who would understand me or understand what I'm going through and we become friends. And I'm just wondering, and they become some of my closest friends. I'm wondering if you have anything like that. Is it the opposite of what I just described or is it? Yeah, mine is the opposite. I, um, I will cut you if we compete. I do not care. I will never lie, (laughs) cheat, or steal. I'll never do it unethically, but I will cut you as deep as I can to win. And and the reason that I fight so hard to win is because I hope that the fruits of my labor can help other people who don't ever get a chance to to do that. Um, And I like competing with people. I am ruthless to a degree. And again, I think the guidelines, the parameters are you know, much like you guys compete in your own space, it still has to be done ethically. It still has to have a high moral compass. It still has to be fair. And so, you know, I'd like to outwork people. I like to out negotiate people. I like to outmaneuver people. But my secret sauce has always been, um, I can get people to follow me. And I can get people, um, the frontline folks to believe in what I'm telling them because I actually hate CEOs. I mean, I hate them with a passion. I hate big companies uh, where, where the bureaucrats are sort of sitting in the ivory tower and, and living a, their best life on somebody else's back. And I like to take them down. And the reason that I got involved in small business many, many years ago is because the small business owner, in my own mind, not in reality, has a similar narrative to my childhood, which is they always get left out. They're always sort of like, oh, 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 so this Saturday, I'm going to give you some business. Uh, They're always sort of behind the eight ball and nobody's cheering for them um, when nobody's looking. People are cheering for them when, when, when there's an ad campaign from a big company that says support small business, which I think is bullshit. Excuse me. But I, I am the most competitive person you'll meet in business. And I don't care. And I don't apologize if I, if I take business from you but I do care about what I do with the fruits of that labor. And that, and that's why you've been involved in so many uh, charitable organizations and so many, uh, uh, is, is that what you're talking about? No, that's why I spent $75 million of my own money in the last eight years investing in small businesses that I right. actually think I'll never get a return on. Right. Wow. Ever. Wow. And my theory was, is that it was a giant social experiment. And the social experiment is if you give somebody an opportunity that can't get it elsewhere, what do they do with it? I don't know. Yeah. It's up to the individual, not the business. So when did this competitive kind of cutthroat attitude, when did that first start for you? Was that at a very early age or as you're, you found your, your business niche? When did, when did you know that, hey, no matter what someone does, I'm going to compete and I'm going to win no matter what happens? When did that develop? I used to own uh, so two, two specific things. When I was six years old, And I know everybody hears about kid businesses and laugh. When I was six years old, 
there was this one kid that was really popular in school and he used to sell candy. Okay. And he used to make a good living and everybody liked him because he was a popular. And I started studying the kind he had of candy. candy. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, I studied the candy that he would buy and the prices that he would charge. And I figured that the way that I could beat him is that I would get better candy and give more candy for less money. <laughs> and I, he ended up uh, beating me up in the schoolyard because he said I ruined his business. And I said, well, by the way, we're six, but when we're 16 or 26, I'm going to put you out of business. And then I got a little bit older and uh, there was this, uh, there was this, I would call him like a middle-aged teenager that had a lawn service in my neighborhood. And there was a black guy that lived about two or three blocks away that, uh, that was also in the lawn business. And his machinery was kind of rickety and his trailer was kind of beaten up. And he was always the nicest guy to me. Like he would always like, nobody wanted to hang out with me and he would hang out with me. And he was a lot older than I was. And uh, I had saved up a lot of money as a kid. I always like my save my Christmas money, my birthday money. I was always a saver. So one day I went to his house and I said, I got $15,000. I was like 12. Okay. And I said, I want to partner with you. But I said, I have a strategy. We're going to get new equipment. We're going to get a new trailer. We're going to come up with a new name. You're going to be the boss. Cause I didn't want, it was his business. And he was like maybe 18 or something. And you're going to be the boss, but I'm going to be the one that goes to the doors. And I studied the, the, the different uh, houses that the other kids did business at. And I went and knocked on everybody's door. And I said, I'd like a chance to earn your business. I'm going to do your lawn for free for a month. And then, what, and how much is the other guy charging? $35. He said, I'm going to do your lawn for free for a month. And then I'm going to do a one-year contract for $30. And then I'm going to also be responsible to do the edging and the weeding and all this other stuff. And I was, again, more value for less money. Get your foot in the door and then upsell them. And my, the, the other guy's name, the, 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 the guy that I invested with, his name was Jacques. He was a Bahamian guy. That's how I learned a lot of bad Bahamian words. And, uh, <laughs> and we ended up going into business together and I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know how to cut grass. And he used to say to me, you stay off the lawn. Like you don't, you don't, you, you know how to do this. You just be the mouthpiece. And we ended up putting those other kids out of business. Did you get beat and, up again? No, I didn't get beat up <laughs> okay. again because I had Jock. <laughs> yeah, no, that's because, right. No, but I had Jock and he was a bad dude, but not with me. Right. And I remember one time we were somewhere and I think we were like, he like took me in his car to Seven Eleven or something. And somebody was, I had glasses and big hair and I was a fat kid. And uh, somebody was saying something to me. And that's the story I was telling you about kicking doors down. Right. And uh, he walked up to this guy and he said, let me just tell you something. This is my little brother and I will put you through the plate glass window. Now I'm, I'm a little like, like a little white kid. And people are like, that's your brother. He said, yeah, you got a problem with that. And I never forgot that because I helped him grow his business and he protected me. And what I learned in that moment was that, that was my superpower. My superpower was business. I didn't have any other superpower. I could outsmart people. I could outmaneuver them. I could outnegotiate them. That was my superpower. Wow. It's wow, good to be able to discover your superpower. Yeah. Well, a lot you know, of people never you know, do. And one of the things that you said a few minutes ago is uh, kicking down those doors. And basically kicking down those doors of people, that's something that you didn't want to do or was willing to do, but giving them opportunities and options and showing them how they could kick down them doors themselves. That's more powerful than you doing it for them. I mean, because now they find that something that they could do and they're passionate about. So, you know, you, you don't see that that often as you know, someone who creates those type of opportunities for people. Well, I think I, part of it, Dominique, that I hope, I always try to think about like if I was the other person. Right. And I'm, I'm doing this food program right now um, called Plating Change, where I took a million dollars and I want, I'm driving that money through local restaurants and in turn feeding people that are food insecure. And I did, you know, I did a, 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 a restaurant with Matthew McConaughey it was, it was a place that he worked at when he was a kid. And I did a, a crab restaurant with Pharrell in Virginia. And and at the end of the day, what I what I really learned about myself and other people is that loyalty and respect solves everything. It really does. You can be not even really good at business, but if you're loyal to customers and you respect them and you treat them right, at the end of the day, that's what people really want. Exactly, of course. 
You talked a lot about, uh, you, we, I've heard you talk about your grandfather and him being a big influence on you um, in, in, as a mentor. And, and um, is it, are some of these, it sounds like the qualities you're describing in yourself um, are things that you discovered on your own at an early age, but were they things that you talked to your grandfather about? Was it was, did he instill some of this in you or was he just a sounding board? Not no, just, we had, I mean that. so um, I'm really glad that you asked that because I don't get to talk about it much. My grandfather and I had a terrible relationship. Oh, interesting. He was like my kryptonite huh. in the sense that he was so ruthless with me and so rough on me. And uh, I'll tell you a really quick story. So uh, there was a lot of cousins in our family and a lot of kids like me. And, um, and uh, he was always extra tough on me, really, really extra tough on me. And uh, I could never figure out why. My family was big Republicans in Miami. And uh, I went to school in Milwaukee at Marquette. And when I went back to Miami, um, I uh, was working for him at his car dealership. While I was in college, I worked uh, for the Democratic Party. I interned, you know, with Bill Clinton and it was Herb Call and it was interesting. When I got back to Miami, the Democratic Party called me and asked me if I wanted to run for office. I was 21 years old. I didn't know anything about, like nothing about politics. And I decided to run for office and I um, went down to the government office and I enrolled and the next morning, my mom calls me at six in the morning and she says, uh, have you seen the newspaper? We got a problem. What's the problem? Go get your newspaper. And on the front page, it says, you know, so-and-so's grandfather, uh, so-and-so's grandson running for, uh, for Congress as a Democrat. So uh, he had told my mom to have me come to the dealership. I had a car from the store, a dealership. I drove down to the dealership. It was like eight or nine in the morning. And, my, and he was like 90 something at the time. And he, I walked in his office and he said, give me your keys. Here's your last check. You're fired. Don't ever come here again. And I said, well, what happened? He said, you don't just get to make decisions about your life. I make the decisions and you're nothing unless I say so. I lost the uh, campaign. I learned a lot about myself. I met Wayne Heisinga. I got into the car business. My grandfather was in the car business. We ended up buying his dealership. And 10 years later, I knew how much money my grandfather had. I knew how much money he had. We didn't talk for years. One day I went to his house, hadn't seen him in years. And I said, listen, I just wanted to sort of rectify things with you. And I had an envelope in my hand. And I said, you know, do you remember that day you told me that I'd never be anything without you? He said, I don't remember that. I said, well, you did. You told me I needed your permission. I pulled out my bank statement. And I said, I know how much money you have. And I said, I have more money than you do. And I was 20 some odd years old. And I see that I said to him, you see the difference is I don't think that it matters. You do. And you wanted to control me. And so he was a big influence on me. And a couple of years later, right before he died, we had one more meeting. And I don't know if he was BSing me or not, but he said to me, you know why I was so tough on you? Because I knew you'd be great if I was. The rest of these kids, they're bums. They want a free lunch. They want me to buy them free things. They want to eat, eat, live in a free house and drive a free car. But when I took you out of the orphanage in Lebanon, which is where I'm from, I knew you were different. And I was mean to you and I was tough on you. And I knew I ruined my relationship with you. But look at you now, you're better than me. Now, I think he was full of shit. I was gonna ask. <laughs> I was gonna ask what you thought about that. Yeah, but, the veracity of that statement. But, as it, but at, his, at his age and my respect for seniors, I said to him, thank you for making me the man I am today. Now, I, I really told my mom that it was her, but she thanked me for saying that it was him. Yeah. But I'll never forget that. And so people can be a big influence on you, and it doesn't always have to be in a good way. Yeah. No, that's true. So mentor was probably not the right word I, uh, uh, in retrospect, but, but yeah. a huge influence, definitely. He was my Jeffrey. When you well, yeah. the thing is, coming from a pretty decent background where you didn't really have to worry about things, people expected you to be, be okay with just being an ordinary guy. You get your stuff from family. And, and it really is no interest. You have no interest to really motivate yourself. And that's what a lot of times when I see a lot of these kids who come from wealth, that's the way they live their life. And so there's no motivating factor in their life to push them to be bigger. Because I always believe 
it's what you do today that dictates what you become in the future. And a lot of people, you know, you've been around this. I've been around who always look for handouts and don't want to do the little things to be successful. I, I want my son, I want my daughters to be better than me, but you got to work at it. And a lot of people are not willing to put in that work. Yeah. Well, there's probably a tension. And I don't have kids. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm probably speaking out of my, you me know, neither. Yeah. yeah me neither. but, but I've, there's gotta be a tension. You want to provide you. And I know my dad had said this too, because he came from a single mom and they literally lived on the wrong side of the tracks. They were the only house on across the tracks from, uh, from the rest of the town. Um, and he always wanted to provide his kids and his family with more than he had, but he also wanted us not to get lazy. And there was a point where, and he, we were never rich or by any extent, but there was one point where, uh, in the early in high school where he essentially had to sit me down and say, let me explain what my life was like, you know, let me explain the types of things you need to do. Um, to actually grow as a person. You can't expect this. Um, and it was good. It helped me. It shocked me. Uh, I was pissed at him at first because I was embarrassed, but, uh, but there, but there has to be that tension that parents have. I mean, Nick, you probably have this where you want to provide more, but you want to make them also understand what work is like. Well, you know, the funny thing is, you mentioned that, you know, I grew up, you know, pretty much spending for spending for myself. Um, you know, I, I, I developed that attitude early on that, you know, I'm going to make it, you know, but I'm going to do it on my terms, not on your terms. And I used to have people when I was young used to tell me all the time, I would never be anything. I would never make it. Nobody wanted a tall, skinny kid like you to come out of the the project. And I said, you know what, you guys, I might not make it, but I'm going to die trying. And it just, it was just fuel to make me go that extra yard, do more work than the next, always early and always the last one to leave. And so they helped me, that neighborhood helped me develop that attitude. So uh, oftentimes you, you hear me thank my old neighborhood for making me the person I am, that toughness, that, that willing to be successful at something that I know I was good at. And so that negative reinforcement helped me. You know, I, I welcomed it. That's big. I'm curious, um, so Marcus, when you, you've, you started so many different businesses, um, and do you consider all the, all the the different paths you've taken? Do you consider it? Um, is it sort of Bowie esque, where you're changing, like you're reinventing yourself, or does it feel like a streamline for you? How much of this was planned and 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 vi- envisioned beforehand? I answer it two ways. You know, I mean, um, I'm a big believer in in story. Right. And so I think about it even when I'm making television, it's story is everything for me. Um, and, and, and I think my story is, is pretty simple. Um, well, not simple, but it's, it's pretty clear for me. Uh, I sort of, I'm always punting hmm. and I'm always trying to figure it out and I'm always trying to learn and get better. And I make a lot of mistakes. I mean, I just, I make way more mistakes um, than most people think I do. And part of it is because I just try different stuff and it's like, I'm on a giant, um, you know, like Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. I'm on a giant trip and I love what I do. I'm blessed. I'm blessed by the fact that I can try things, but I have reinvented myself a lot because I struggle with, uh, being satisfied with who I am. Hmm. And that's a hard thing for people to admit. Um, I, I love my life. I love my wife. I'm grateful, but I never really feel satisfied. And I think what happens is I'm always looking to learn more and to try more things. I'm not scared to fail. I'm not scared to be embarrassed. Like you can't embarrass me. There's nothing you could say or do that's going to embarrass me. So I think you have to have that mentality. I, I don't know if anybody could honestly say that they have a plan. Because God has a plan and, and other people have plans and we're not control of plans. And you may have kids and your kids may get sick. You may be responsible to take care of your parents. Like we just don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. And so I try to stay pretty nimble. I start businesses largely uh, and I invest in business because I want to learn something. And I ultimately want to learn more about myself and what my tolerance level is and what my ability to be a chameleon is and what my ability to learn how to deal with new people is, how I deal with being taken advantage of or cheated or lied to or stolen. And how do I react to that? And how can I get better at that? It's, um, 
it's hard. It's exhausting, to be honest with you. And I'm not really sure what I'm driving towards. And I don't say that publicly often because then people will think I'm like a manic. Uh, but I love what I do and I do it with my own money and my own time. And so I kind of don't owe anybody an explanation. I think it probably comes from um, sort of feeling like I can be a master of my own domain. I wish I had a story. I don't know what the hell my story is. <laughs> that is a story, but that's, that is a great story. And yeah, it's interesting yeah. that you talk about that, that uh, about what leads you into um, some of these decisions as they're, as you're presented with them. Um, uh, we were talking with Alex Bloomberg, who's a journalist uh, and uh, founder of Gimlet Media, formerly This American Life. Um, and uh, one of the things I knew about him, but also that he talked about his intense curiosity about the world. What is that? He started Planet Money because he was like, I don't understand finance and I want to understand it more. And creating that show where he could ask questions and break everything down was his way of understanding that world. And he created this insanely popular show. But you know what, though? I find mm -hmm. myself much sometimes to my peril trying to prove that I'm more than less than. Hmm. And that's not hmm. always a good thing, right? Because you end up making decisions that aren't based on the right motivation. You know, if you feel like you're less than and you're trying to be just more than that, you end up sometimes spinning your wheels. And as a 47-year-old man um, who's been very blessed in a lot of ways, you would think that like, why would you even feel like you need to do that anymore? And it's probably like a little bit of psychological warfare in my own head. So at this point in your life, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, if you've accomplished so much, there's so many companies that you're involved in and help grow. What, at this point in time in your life, what keeps you and makes you dominant? Two things. One, um, my desire to uh, prove that I know how to manage and be with and understand people better than anybody. I'm the, I know people better than anybody in the world. Now, whether that's true or not, I've convinced myself of it. <laughs> but what makes me dominant is that I understand the human psychology because I'm willing to self-deprecate to a degree where I can get other people to do the same. And then we, we sort of learn something about ourselves. I think the second thing is what makes me dominant is that I don't uh, yearn for things anymore like I used to. And I have this goal of giving away everything that I ever made before I die. Uh, I don't have kids, so oh, it doesn't wow. really matter. And it freaks people out when I say that. They're like, yeah, but I'll take some. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, but you're good. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I need yeah. to make sure that I leave this earth better than when I found it. And, and I think the human psychology, the knowledge of human psychology is my secret weapon. I understand people. And I'll even use you, Dominique, as an example, okay? Uh, everybody knows you uh, from, from a mass market standpoint. Everybody knows you in your role as a world-class athlete. I don't see that. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful of your athletic skills, and I'm sure that that's really wonderful, and it's provided you an income and all those things. But as I study you, and I did study you before I, you know, I, you know, started like engaging and wanting to contribute right. to your things that are important. It's like, what is it that makes this guy really special? And I think what makes you special as an outside observer who's never met you in my entire life uh, is your love of your family. You're one hundred percent right. Um, it, it, my family. Like, I don't really give a shit if yeah, you ever. Yeah. I don't even know if you. I don't. I don't. I don't know how tall you are. I don't know any of your stats, but I do know that you're an amazing dad. Hey, I really appreciate that. That really means a lot. You know, and uh, you know, through my life, you know, my family is all I had. My mom raised eight kids by herself. That's how she did it. I don't know. Um, so I, I told my mom a long time. Were ago. you the easy one, by the way? Of the eight, were you the easy one? Yeah, I think I was. I, at least my brother's going to tell you something different, but I think I was the easy one. But, you know, one thing I told her a long time ago, and I remember she was sitting on the step and she was crying. And I said, uh, what's the matter, mom? She said, well, we don't have anything to eat today. I said, don't worry. One day I'll make you rich. You would never have to worry about another meal. And I remember working from the time I was 12 to the time I was 18. I bought my mom my first house. Don't ask me how I did it. I don't, I don't know how I did it, but I hustled and had odd jobs and did, you know, I was hustling bottles and stuff and bottle caps. I mean, every little thing I could to save money to help my mom, that's what I did. And 
she never missed another meal. And so that's how I am today with my family, with people that I'm very close to. I like giving. I mean, that's that's one of my... How many kids do you have? My, I have five girls, two sons. Yeah, so it's crazy. Um, as I said to you a minute ago, and, and, and I want to leave you with this sort of image, I can't even tell you what the surrounding image is or why it sticks in my head or where it comes from. And I'm telling you, as God is my witness, I did not look at it before I got on this call. Right. I think if most people asked, like, what's the first thing that pops in your brain when you think about Dominique, they would, they would tell you a bunch of things that you've heard. So I don't need to right. tell you. The only image in my mind is I, I have this picture in my mind that I saw somewhere at some point in time, and it could have been recently or it could have been old, mm -hmm. of you holding one of your girls uh, while they had a basketball in their hand and they were about to put it in the hoop and there's you and there's them. And I can't tell you what anybody was wearing or anything, but when somebody mentions your name or I was about to come on here, that's the first thing that pops in my brain. And, and your daughter, I think it was your daughter that you were holding up. It was my daughter. It's my, she's that special needs. That was, my was, special was needs. higher mm -hmm. than you were meaning <laughs> that because of the way you had lifted her up, she was above you from a height standpoint. And in my mind, the symbolism behind that was that you're putting everybody above yourself, particularly this daughter. And that's what really matters to you. And the visual of what people would expect to see you doing with the basketball and what I saw were two very different things. And I think that's what makes you special. You know what? I, wow. I've never heard anyone express it the way you just expressed it uh, as far as how I look at life and what you see in a person who's done more than just, you know, created things for himself or a life for himself or how he's created a life for others. And my daughter, my youngest daughter is everything. And so I look at her and said, you know, you are big, you are, you are taller. You can do more than me, even though you're in a wheelchair, it doesn't mean a thing. You can still have your own independence and do special things in life. And she's uh, everything in the world to me. Well, I'm really so proud really of you, man. That. I'm really proud because we need more role models as dads. And um, and uh, the fact that you've dedicated your life to other people through Culture City and your family, uh, it just, it, it really is something that all of us should study and learn from. And, and hopefully we all get better just by watching you. Thank you, man. And I really appreciate you being a part of the Dominant Project and helping help others. So I can express how that makes us feel so thank you we That's really awesome. appreciate your time you got it thank you so much all right. really great all time. right guys take care take care hey thank you for watching the dominant ones don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons to know when we release our next episodes and please let us know in the comments what makes you dominant